Sponsored by Hive Mind CRM. It is more than just a CRM. It is a real estate and business mastermind that comes with an all-in-one CRM. You can have unlimited websites and users. You can call, text, RVM, and email all in one user interface. And you can set up custom automations for any type and multiple businesses. 65% of companies start using a CRM system within the first five years of business. Once implemented, the Hive Mind will save you on marketing, give you more time, and make more money. One of our users had his first $100,000 month using our system in June. We want to see you automate and accelerate your business. Text us at 210-972-1842 for future meetings and of course to get our $1 course on how to make more than six figures on one land deal. You can schedule your free demo today at hivemindcrm.io. Hey, we're here with Aaron Bear. Is it Bear? Yep. Aaron Bear. I don't want to say bar, and I'm like, only person that introduces is Aaron Bear, Aaron Bar. Yep. <laughs> but uh, we're here with Aaron Bear. He talks about exponential, exponential theory, exponential theory. Um, first of all, I always like ans- asking, I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out of touch a little bit. It's okay. I, this, is why, this is why I have editors, but um, I'm not going to edit it because this shows the experience of a podcaster that we had just <laughs> which I like doing anyway. So, um, Aaron Bear, one of the first questions I always like asking is, how did you become an entrepreneur and how long have you been an entrepreneur? This is like my first question I always like asking. Um, well, yeah, how did, so right around, um, yeah, I got a good story about that. The Right around the millennium, so it, it shows you a little bit, is I've been an entrepreneur since then. And um, it, it started really where there was these uh, two ladies that had a um, cultural uh, assessment and we were heading in, uh, if you recall, in the days of WorldCom and Enron, where culture was becoming an important conversation. So I, I saw this trend and I saw these ladies that had this um, this cultural assessment that they would go into companies and use. And the time they were doing about $250,000 a year, really small business consulting practice. And I came into them and I said, hey, uh, I'd like to take your tool to the next level. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, become a you know, salesman for for this and, you know, give me 25% of whatever I sell and give me 10% equity in your company for every $500,000 that I create in revenue. And within uh, five years or within six months, I, I basically had created two and a half million dollars of revenue. So I own 50% of the company and that, that obviously, um, you know, we had to change our business relationship, but that was my first entrance and exit into being an entrepreneur is really helping a company uh, scale 10x itself uh, in a six month period, just because I saw the opportunity that the world was looking at assessing their culture, just because they really was the first time they ran amok when you, you know, you started hearing about Enron and WorldCom and all these companies that Tyco, which Tyco was actually one of our first clients that I sold, um, that things were going wrong in their culture. And there was a way to obviously identify that. So, um, it was my first entrepreneurial venture. Since then, I've been on my entrepreneurial path. I never looked back. Sold my first company then and sold 12 companies since then. Probably failed at more than that. I created three accelerators and incubators and three sustainable nonprofits uh, along the way as well. So been busy, but, um, you know, learned and, and have won, won quite a few times. But uh, part of that journey was learning from the, the failures and moving forward. So I was always that... Uh, perennial uh, serial entrepreneur that once I sold something, I was already into something else and rolled all the money, you know, gambled it all on the next one and just, you know, kept going over and over again. And so a lot of people was like, oh, wow, you sold 12 companies. You must be just, you know, sitting back on an island or whatever. But uh, um, part of the entrepreneurial, uh, the love of the labor is that uh, every one of those dollars went back in the next venture. So I'm only as good as my last venture. So um, I'm, I'm here and uh, I have a, a house over my head and uh, obviously a retirement account that uh, I'm not too worried, but uh, very, very excited to be launching my next business, which is 1 million exponential leaders, which really is something that'll be, I work on the rest of my life is really helping others become exponential leaders because I really stumbled upon this process um, while I was out on a 
15 year journey kind of learning uh, about exponential leaders and working with companies, uh, very large companies like Daimler and Coca-Cola and Belfius Bank, which is the National Bank of Belgium, helping them look across overseas to different places like Tel Aviv, Shanghai, Singapore, London. And I would take these big companies into these ecosystems and meet the most exponential startups to kind of share, this is what is going to disrupt you. And I've been doing that for, like I said, 15 years. And that led to the research of this book, Exponential Theory, that ultimately leads to the start of this new startup, One Million Exponential Leaders, which candidly is such an exponential goal that I plan on, you know, really working on this the rest of my life and helping others find their exponential path to entrepreneurship, to, you know, really create the next uh, giant in whatever industry they're in. And that's the, the fun part of it. Um, I'm working with a lot of different industries, uh, everything from very one man startups to venture backed to candidly $10 billion energy companies that want to learn how to leverage exponential technology so they don't get disrupted in the future. So it's, that is my path. And uh, I'm really glad to be on this uh, podcast here with you this morning. That is amazing. I have so many questions. Okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. How is it? So you went, so you helped a company 10 X their growth in six months. How do you do that? Like you dig into the, the personnel, is it sales? Is it all the above? Is it the exponential theory? Let's kind of dive into that. Like, what Well, the, the lifeblood of any company is sales. And that's where I came from. I actually used to run the National Association of Sales Professionals. And I was the, ended up being the sales professional of the year there and, and ended up getting offered to be president of the organization after I met the the former president, and they said, hey, we need someone like you to take it over and take the next level. And in 18 months, grew that and actually sold it to a group out of Detroit, Camelot Ventures, which is part of Dan Gilbert, who owns, you know, the, the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans, you know, a bunch of other things. There's a, a wow. gentleman there that ran a Tony Robbins uh, franchise that actually acquired that because we went from 3,000 members to 60,000 in 18 months. So I think part of sales, you know, I think is the lifeblood of a startup and it's the one skill that is unavoidable, you yeah. know, for, for a perennial entrepreneur. And the way that I did that for this first venture that I 10 X did is I just saw that there was a huge opportunity and this wasn't a very sales focused organization. They were, they actually had a good product. I actually went out and looked at 10 different products and then chose them, which they just happened to be in my backyard these two ladies, uh, Liz and PJ. And from there, you know, we went to market and obviously uh, grew the company very, very quickly just because there was such a need for that at that time. And, you know, it, it was one of those quick ups and gains. And then it was like, okay, I exited it. And then now what? That moved me forward into some other assessment products and then to something called jobbing.com where I launched Jobbing TV. And then out of Jobbing TV, I launched the National Association of Sales Professionals and a company called Purposely. And it just, from there, I, I launched a digital agency that allowed me to create an accelerator. And then I partnered with other accelerators and I was always having my hands in the different startups. And that all led me back to writing a, a little model around entrepreneurship that led me into thinking, how do I, and then I started teaching really big companies how to be more entrepreneurial. And that led back to Exponential because at the end of the day, they were really worried about these exponential businesses that were disrupting every little part of their business. Okay. Um, so that, you know, you can kind of relive my journey there, you know, in a, in a different perspective. I think that's what led me into this is to realize that it all comes down to mindset. You know, you have to have a good relationship with sales and marketing, you know, and, and that's where, you know, part of it is that, that grind, that hustle, but it was the enjoyment of of getting out there and talking to people about a new product just like you know, right now i'm on a podcast kind of sharing about one million exponential leaders i ended up ultimately creating a sales model that has never get caught selling you know and it, and it really is sales is dead even when i was running the national association of sales professionals i used to say sales is dead and it's because we we really have a very negative emotional response to when someone is selling us but yeah. the reality is what the internet and all the information has done is, is put us all into a buyer funnel and that buyer funnel we're always in and we're always, our attention is buying. And unfortunately it's, it's like everybody that gets caught in the e-commerce checkout lane, you know, ready to buy something. They're like, why am I buying this? And it's because we are now programmed to buy. We are just consumers. We're materialistic. 
uh, with compare culture, with, you know, all these things online, doom scrolling, you know, it's just helping us scroll until we find something we want to buy. And that's where all these exponential companies have really taken advantage of the consumers because you're always in a buyer funnel. So for enough information to make that decision. And so through Robert Cialdini wrote a book called The Power of Influences that literally starts out in this funnel where you establish authority and liking and that you can do through asking questions, which is in every sales process is, you know, you can build rapport, then ask questions. And through asking questions, you, you you know, you need to establish social proof, uh, consistency, asking those questions, getting people to understand your solution and how it fits into their life personally, professionally and organizationally. And then, you know, to close that, it's offer it's all through scarcity, contrast, and reciprocity of giving them something. And that model works so well. There's a channel online called QB, QVC that I'm sure you're familiar with Yeah. that uses this basic model. And they now are a $13 billion operation, you know, literally selling with one-way communications through a TV that has literally taken that Robert Cialdini model and used it to a perfection. So I, when I consult, I generally take people through this kind of sales training, which like I said, sales is dead is don't get, you know, and really help people just be consultative and helping them actually eliminate them. Like, Hey, this may not be right for you. This may make everything. So life becomes pretty easy when people engage and you're looking out for their best interest. Always at the end of the day, people that are going to fit are going to be the ones that are going to be good clients. And all of a sudden you see your world grow exponentially quick. And that's, that's part of the training that I do when I go into companies is help the sales force really have a better relationship with the purpose of the company. And I think that's the biggest thing. And that's why I named my own company, 1 Million Exponential Leaders. My only goal is to enroll people that want to be an exponential leader and that it's willing to do the work. And that goes that we enroll companies and their whole entire teams. We enroll startups as well as individuals in our Think Bigger course. And that's that's part of it. But you know, most for the most part, we're looking for ways that if they don't fit, we don't necessarily want to have them waste their time, money, or energy in it. They'll also take away from other people that are in the program. So it's, it, it leads to, it's, to me, it's, I've created this process to become very easy to do that. With that said, it's not that you always have the right message or the right timing, which I actually talk about that in my book a lot. That's the important part to know that I've even failed in a company in the last year. That's fine. It's a learning experience. And that's what I look at failure is as long as you're learning from it or, and you're winning or you're winning, you know, you're doing one or the other. The only problem with failure is if you keep doing it over and over again, then you're never going to get anywhere. So if you learn, you obviously won't do those things again. And that's, that's part of the 1 million exponential leaders where we talk to uh, the leaders that enroll with us. We get them in that mindset. And that's really the mindset of Elon Musk, of Bill Gates, of you know Steve Jobs, of a number of uh, entrepreneurs that have obviously taken their idea to be exponential. Studying that over the last 15 years, actually meeting those people, uh, interviewing and learning from them has been part of my journey that now I get to share that with the people that enroll in 1 million exponential leaders. So what's that? Is it always a mindset thing that hinders people from becoming an exponential leader in general. And you're talking about training. It sounds like you're talking about training the exponential leader that trains the sales team. So you're managing your training, your, your exponential leadership program is, is a whole training program for whole sales teams and company. It's for whole companies because it's everyone in the company really needs to think bigger about what they're doing. Otherwise, you know, a lot of times there's a part of the group that may think big and they get obstacles elsewhere, but it's like, how do you expand the mindset of everyone? But Daniel, to your, your first part of that, it, yes, it is mindset. And I think so many people, we have part of our training kind of really goes through how do you get mindful and into the moment now, where now is the most important time. And in fact, having this conversation is the most important thing that I can do because, you know, if we impact one or two of your listeners, you know, we're on a path to help create exponential leaders, which exponential leaders solve really big problems. Yeah. And that's what we need right now in a world that seems plagued with issues, you know, and, and complexities. We need the, you know, we need these exponential leaders to to embrace and solve problems in whatever industry or whatever their movement is. But going in the mindset, I think part of it is, is we're so anchored by our past. So part of our, our training is through neuroscience and psychology, positive psychology and neuro-linguistic programming is how do we actually have a relationship with what's happened in our past and whether that's trauma or regrets or limitations that others have put on us. And then if you can think back when you were maybe four or five, six or seven years old and you woke up and your day was like, what am I going to create today? You know, and there was yeah. a point and everyone has that. And somewhere along the line between school and teachers and parents, we put all these limitations on our kids and then they're 18 or 19 and they're like, well, I can't do that. And I can't. And so they have all these limitations. So we actually have a process that kind of strips that away so that people can get back to a place where they understand that today is no different 
different than when you were four, five, or six. You just choose to make it different by all the constraints you put on yourself or limitations that you've let other people say you can or cannot do something. That's the first part of being exponential. The second part is how do you feel about your future? And this really goes to the self-talk that you have. And it's a lot, a lot of that can be removed by actually having a relationship. And we'll even take certain traumas that people have had in their past and really help them understand that was an obstacle in your way. Now, how do we make meaning of that? So it actually gives you fuel that it actually accelerates your own belief, which you know, if you've overcome that, you're still here, you're still alive, you overcome that. There is a reason and something you can learn from that. And there's something that you can, you know, literally kind of put that into your past because why are we carrying it into our future? And our future is, you know, basically loaded with stress, anxiety, worries, fears, and doubts that are all artificial. They're all made up. And I, I use the word acronym fear, false evidence appearing real. When we look out into the future, you know, we're, we're really, you know, a lot of times seeing things and we're making things up about what it potentially could be. The reality of how we approach our future is if we can create a breakage from, you know, all these limitations and past, and we can actually understand that whatever we do now, if we can start think bigger, bigger about our lives, one, we start we stop splitting the small stuff and we start actually seeing a, a brighter future. And that optimistic will allow you to make that extra five sales call, that extra 10 sales calls, whatever it is to, that your business is going to be successful. But if your purpose is so big, like 1 million exponential leaders, um, which obviously will impact billions of people because, you know, if a million exponential leaders are doing things in every different industry, you know, we're literally impacting the world. That goal is so big that every day I can work on that. And every day, every time I can put more energy into that and it's, it's a, you know, it, it basically gets me out of bed early in the morning and I'm as happy on Mondays as I am Fridays. Yeah. Um, you know, it becomes a much easier life. And I, and I say that you can choose to suffer in the, you know, in the Buddhist way is, you know, it is a choice. The best thing to not suffer is find something that you love doing and do it every day. Then you're never going to work another day in your life. And, and candidly, life gets pretty easy because especially if you're always looking for, you know, people to, to have conversations with about this, you know, whether it's on a podcast and whether it's just to individually help them and move them along, maybe they're not the right fit. That's my goal. It's just really helping people think bigger about themselves, whether they enroll in our program program or not, it does, does not matter. The fact that if they get two bits of information about this and actually think bigger about themselves or share that, then we've we've uh, done a good deed for the day. How do you help people get out of monotony? Because I feel like the people, one of the things that hinders a lot of companies and sales teams is they do the same thing every day. And that thing that's kind of inundated with school is that they're stuck on a routine. How, what's, what, what's something you can give advice if they're stuck in, in like a, in a process that they're just, they can't get, they can't overcome? Well, one of our first processes we do in this is to, you know, and I'll, I'll summarize it. It's, it's not exact. I mean, but as we have everybody write all the things that are on their mind and the first time I ever did it, I wrote 384 things. And we actually then go back through all the traumas, all the limitations, all the regrets. We start working through these issues. And, and a lot of times actually people will physically get sick thinking about these things and and really get over them very very quickly they'll get sick and then they'll have joy and i think that's the experience that people have of you know getting over some of these things that have been holding them back because we actually hold our emotions in us but our process of of moving forward in our day of we really look at the habits of how are you spending your time because you're a few good habits away from being an exponential entrepreneur and you're a few bad habits away from being broke in, on the street <laughs> so it, it really comes down to your habits. And I actually have a saying is uh, the goal is not the end. And it's really is if you focus on your goals, why better than that focus on your habits? Like what are your habits to those goals? So, you know, the reality is part of our process is to assess every day. Are these habits working for me? And it's the 80, 20 rule. There's a bunch of different mental models that we use to help people through that, but it is self-examination. It's self mastery to understand most people lie to, you know, most salespeople lie to themselves about the, how they're doing. You know, or if they're predicting, if they're predicting their, their sales funnel, they'll actually lie to themselves that they think something's going to close to make themselves feel better than just having the reality to say, okay, this is unlikely and I need to get more sales context. So, you know, that's a process of, again, self-talk that goes back to the, you know, inner conversation that salespeople have um, that's holding them back, whether it's based on something that's happened in the past or whether it's their stress or worries or fears, they're, they're, they're wanting to alleviate the now, but they're not just now in the moment. Moment. And I think that's part of what we do is we start to unpeel that and then people are like, oh, yeah, I can think bigger and now I can make bigger sales calls. And now I can, you know, instead of just going for singles, I can go for home runs every once in a while. And all of a sudden, you know, they become a
become the franchise player on the sales team, which is what we often see is we take people this training and we'll find people that were really in the bottom that they're good at adjusting their habits and they're good at adjusting to change and they grow into that exponential future. And you see the salespeople just skyrocket. So I won't say we're sales trainers, we're really mindset trainers, but in the end, it impacts the sales organization and it impacts the marketing because now marketing starts you know, thinking about how can we do this bigger and they actually get more creative and get more innovative. And that's all of what the little kid in you wants to do, but it's what the company beats out of you to do. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're representing, you're representing the sales team and employees so like, Hey, this is, this is things you need to inundate to make better, to get better results from your employees that you do have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's, we generally work with companies and we work with entire teams. We also work with individuals. We have a think bigger course that just, if an individual wants to take, they can take that. Um, but the real, you know, what we want to do and what is our best for our exponential model is to work with big companies, small companies, every company, but really take their entire workforce to become exponential. And candidly, you know, one of the conversations I have with all is, well, well, what if you make all my employees exponential and they think bigger and they leave me? And I said, well, you want those people to leave because you don't want to hold people back one. Yeah. And candidly, when you start doing that and you become the feeding ground, uh, for exponential leaders, you're going to attract the best talent. So yeah. in the end. And it's thinking more longer term. And that's part of what we also do is so many people are so short term thinking that these exponential leaders are really thinking, you know, 10 years, 25 years in the future, you know, Elon Musk, which could be our mascot for exponential thinker, you know, he literally for SpaceX puts a goal that we're going to civil, you know, put a civilization on Mars by 2040. Well, the reality of that is I, I take like Google created this idea of moonshot. So Elon Musk being the big thinker and understanding exponential technologies says, well, I need to think bigger than the moon. So I'm going to civilize Mars. And I'm going to put the goal so far out there, even if we fail and we don't get there in 2020, he's literally shuttling people back on private air, you know, launching thousands of satellites, shuttling people back and forth from the International Space Station. He's already accomplished more than any other private space organization because he's created the biggest goal. He also has then attracted the best talent. You know, NASA was like one of those places that everyone wanted to work for. Now SpaceX is right there, especially for your, your aeronautical engineers. So he's attracting the best talent because they're actually working on bigger projects and obviously moving faster than NASA was. All that is part of just thinking bigger. It attracts bigger minds to it. So we all want to be part of a purpose that's bigger than ourselves. Um, that's where I really kind of lucked into finding 1 million exponential leaders is that's what I want to do. I want to, I want people that want to be part of that. I want companies that want to be part of that. And that becomes an easy purpose for me every day to talk about, because as you can hear, I'm passionate about it. I want to make those changes for each and every individual in a company, but also for the company themselves. They're going to get exponential results because for too long, we've always thought linearly. And right now the law of accelerating returns that Ray Kurzweil created basically has said that we're literally quadrupling in the last 10 years, we've quadrupled our speed. So that's only going to accelerate, you know, as we go into the future. And what that does is it creates, we are on that exponential curve, especially with 35 different exponential technologies coming in and literally just disrupting every different industry. We now see, you know, these individuals that have been thinking linear completely lost about their future and they have to get on a path where they think faster, make decisions, make make more mistakes, learn from them faster, experiment more, be lean, agile. And that's what every big company in the world right now is struggling because they weren't built to be do that. So we're helping these very large companies think that way, help them kind of break down their processes so that they actually work a little faster and, and honestly just look a little bit more like a startup and with the goal of disrupting themselves potentially because they generally have to kind of disrupt on the outside of their organization and then uh, when it becomes sizable they could bring it back in the organization to you know as long as they don't have it report to someone else that controls the traditional company um, which is a big failure of say like a Walmart which launched e-commerce three times and didn't get it right till the third time um, because they always brought it back in and then they had the guy that was ahead of a uh, Walmart Walmart retail, you know, report to it. So he just kind of quietly killed it because it did not his overall sales goals because it was a disruptive organization. Uh, finally, they brought it back in and had it reporting to the CEO to say this is an independent division. And this is something a lot of big companies need to learn from. It's there is a way to do innovation sprints, exponential sprints, uh, where a company could grow, you know, a lot of these ideas outside and bring them in once they, you know, they gain 
gain their ground. And that's what I've large part done by taking these organizations around the world into these innovation ecosystems is teach them how they can outside of the organization create their own disruption um, and how they can obviously learn from it and start making decisions faster because they, these companies are making decisions slower than the startups. And that's why the startups are obviously growing at much faster pace. Um, it is all about speed. And in, in the book, I talk a lot about that where even Facebook, you know, can literally have 35,000 experiments going at the same time on their platform, your Facebook and mine might not be the same. So they're always iterating on a better experience or a better way to kind of sell a product or push revenue. And obviously they're now creating billions and millions of revenue, even though they have a brand image and some other issues going on, they're also thinking about the next thing. They're, you know, how do I disrupt ourselves and become meta, which very few companies really understand what Mark Zuckerberg is doing, but he sees the metaverse as the next thing. So how does he get there? Because he also sees the slowing of Facebook's growth, not Instagram or WhatsApp, but, you know, of Facebook itself. So it's how do we disrupt that before we get disrupted? And and you, you see that in all these large companies where they're, you know, literally changing their business models. And that's the one thing is there's not a company on this planet that will not change their business model in the next 10 years. And none of these companies that are kind of our five exponential companies that have taken over the world, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google, all those companies are not earning the same revenue in the same way that they did just five years ago or 10 years ago. In fact, they're totally disrupting them. Apple's going to a subscription model. Um, that is a disruption of their business model. So you see just massive changes, but these are what are required for these large companies to continue their dominance. And they recognize making these decisions and making mistakes is the best way to learn and the best way to, to move forward quickly. Man, that's amazing. Let's kind, of, let's kind of bring it down to a granular level. What is, a, what is something someone can do to change their trajectory, to change their mindset, uh, as far as a habit they can create to create a better like future and better, better, better results in whatever they're doing. Yeah, I, I think, you know, part of it is, and, and we, we talk a lot about exponential mindset, but growth mindset is, you know, the idea that, you know, that you learn and iterate from, from what you're doing and, you know, you eventually will get there. And if you have a long enough duration, I think too many people give up right when they're, you know, and, and, and candidly in my own entrepreneurial journey, what I, what I realized is I was better at being a number two or being the consultant sharing, you know, what to do. Um, I wasn't necessarily the exponential leader on the front of it because I always, you know, saw an opportunity to exit and exponential leaders aren't thinking about exiting. You know, they're thinking about growing and changing the world, which I am now. I have no plans on exiting what I'm doing. But that's that's where you see, you know, people get offered massive amounts of sums for their business. Uh, and you realize that they understand that the, doing an exponential company is that you're going to succeed that vision of that. And that's where people tied to their long-term vision will help. So thinking longer term and having the proper amount of determination and persistency to get there. Understanding in the book, I kind of cover this model that's created by Peter Diamantes and Stephen Kotler called the six D's. And that's the six D's of disruption. And once something becomes digitized, it has the ability to become, it has the ability to become exponential because now it's digitized. It's bits and bytes it can grow infinitely there's a long period of deception and we'll use tesla as an example where in 2006 uh elon musk wrote this blog post of and he basically explained where tesla would be right now in 2006 in this blog post and he said i'm gonna create a really expensive car that i'm gonna focus on the battery not necessarily creating the car but i'm gonna create the best battery and it'll be the fastest car so now i can create the fastest car on the road i'm gonna sell it for a very very high price and so he created the Tesla Roadster and literally took the Lotus Esprit body and just put it right on a Tesla, but put the motor in there and was able to sell enough of those to get enough funding that then he created the Model S. And he literally predicts that I'm going to create the Model S, which will be in a really expensive luxury sedan. And that's going to give me a platform that will eventually democratize, which is the furthest end of the 6Ds, this automobile. And now you have the Model 3, which is enter entering into uh, the market at, at a rate that, you know, they sold close to 500,000 them out of their first gate, but that is entering in the market where, you know, he's producing those at such a clip that it's like the new Model T. I mean, you start seeing them everywhere because they're everywhere. But the 6Ds, once past deception, you get to a period of disruption where you actually, now other people are worried about it. And for the longest time, the big car makers weren't worried about electric and weren't worried about Tesla. But once they became disruptive, then they, you know, then there's a period of demonetizing, de dematerializing and 
democratizing this and that's the six d's and if you can look at any industry you can see where that industry is on that trail and that's part of our book is to look at your own industry using that model and it's a it's a very interesting you know kind of snapshot of where an industry may be tesla is moving up where they're you know they dematerialized the engine they've you know now are creating a network where potentially they will create a business model where there's unlimited usage of teslas because why sell a Tesla when everyone, when they might just be everywhere? And that's disruptive to Uber. So you start yeah. thinking about these exponential, you you start to realize is that whatever business model that Tesla is, and I've seen business models where people predict Tesla will be worth $40 trillion, not, you know, that makes Elon Musk the first trillionaire, um, you know, in this. And the reason is, is because, you know, when you start changing what transportation is, if all of a sudden automobiles become profit centers, and instead of selling them, you're just going to actually put them on the roads. You know, Elon Musk is only limited by the ability to produce the item itself. Now, Mercedes Benz and other car makers should be thinking about these strategies, but that's the future is the autonomous game is why would we own a car when we could get in a car and take us anywhere at any time? And it even wired to our phone that it'll just know that we're going to need a car and it has one waiting for us. So um, I see the future is we're, we're literally disrupting and that gets the democratization where we don't own a car we just have access unlimited and we may subscribe to tesla service for a thousand dollars for a hundred dollars a month who knows um and have unlimited transportation and that's where now you democratize that where every person on the planet you know is getting in a tesla to go wherever they want and that that's potentially a future outcome that's one of the scenarios that we play with uh when i work with automobile manufacturers because it's stuff they're not thinking about that that really is a reality today when you look at how the infrastructure we actually see it could actually exist right now um i don't think the world's quite ready for it but it's going to happen sooner than than they think yeah there's a a lot of a lot of change coming that people aren't ready for and yeah. it's coming faster than we realize just because the world's moving fast and i think i think what the crazy thing about this is that the state and the countries are behind because they're just not paying attention they're not paying attention and actually seeing what's actually happening in the real world where it's already happening. So legislation is behind of where it should be, but also it already be here. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I mean, I think we we have some hiccups and different things with autonomous vehicles, and I think that's part of the journey. But in, in the end, if you really look at, uh, there's 1.3 million people that die in automobile accidents. Well, when cars are able to talk to each other and every car is autonomous, then you don't have automobile accidents. So now, you know, transportation becomes safe. and you know, statistically, it's already safer than a, you know, someone driving behind a car. But yeah. once it becomes, once we actually start creating some rules and regulations about how they talk, and I've been to the Shanghai and seen kind of like these uh, super automated cities where, you know, all the cars and all the traffic lights and everything moving, you know, talks to each other. Um, you know, that's, you know, we're, I won't, won't say we're moving towards that where a lot of the risk of that is. And Think about the insurance, the automobile insurance industry. Well, what happens when you have zero accident? Now, do you need much insurance? So that becomes democratized. So all these different things and all these different industries, I think there's exponential kind of opportunities of growth, but people have to understand what that means. There's huge opportunities in every one of those. And that's where people, you know, joining the Think Bigger course, you know, part of that is just getting on there to learn, like, what are the opportunities in my industry or what are the opportunities? How can I find a purpose bigger than myself? But candidly, what they end up finding is something much bigger is that they learn how big of opportunities these are. Because, you know, if you have an exponential company, if you're part of an exponential technology, now there's only a few winners, but candidly, they consolidate and talent obviously moves to the, you know, to the best ones. Then we see these exponential companies and that's where you're seeing, you know, the brands like Tesla and Google and Apple and Amazon have grown to just be exponential behemoths because they demand it because they, you know, that's, part of their value proposition. They've added so much value in a whatever value chain that they're looking at that they don't have competitors. It doesn't mean they won't be disrupted. Every one of them will be disrupted at some point. Um, but right now, it, it's 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 pretty safe to say that some of these companies have enough cash to not really worry about being disrupted because they'll buy whatever disruption. And, you know, including Facebook buying Instagram and WhatsApp may have been, you know, may have been their sustaining moment um, knowing that, uh, you know, everything takes its trend, you know, as far as uh, the life cycle of companies has gone down extremely. And in fact, in the 60s, the average S&P company was on the S&P 500 for 67 years. It's now down to 15. And that's going to continue to shrink. It just 
shows you that you you can't be a big company and think you're too big to fail. Uh, we've proven that over and over again with and and you know the the graveyard of companies, whether it's Kmart, Borders, Kodak, uh, Blockbuster. Uh, there's a whole graveyard that I, I cover a lot of them in the book and some of their mishaps. It's because they had linear thinking and they didn't think about how digitization is going to impact their business. And every industry is going through that, so it, it becomes an interesting conversation. That's why I look forward to having that conversation forever. And I'm always learning. I mean, there's that's the beauty of it is I'm I'm learning or winning. Um, there is no failure. It's just about how fast can you learn. We covered a lot. We covered a lot. I hope I hope people got I hope people caught some of those some of those things because now my mind's working as far as like because like you you don't you need to you need to be aware of trends but you just need to catch one trend. You don't have to be early. You just have to catch it, and you can change your whole business trajectory and business life as far well, as. Creating, creating you say the business. same thing. All the people that bought Bitcoin. Um, I um you know you, you there's I have more uh, should have would have could have stories. Yeah. Um, in 2012, I I had a panel for Bitcoin and I actually bought some. Luck, you know, the, it's a funny story of just catching a trend. I I yeah. left two Bitcoin in there and I I said ah, I'm not going to worry about cash them out. They were only worth like I think 300 bucks each at the time, and then I forgot about them until 2019, and you know was able to to cash out for a you know hundred thousand plus or whatever at the the height of it but um in that kind of experience is at, at one time i think i owned hundreds <laughs> so the mistake is is to understand the longer term uh, horizon if you're going to invest in things early is to be patient and uh ride out that deceptive curve because eventually it will be disruptive and you know eventually bitcoin will be democratized where i early on you know would even say bitcoin someday will be worth a million dollars and I think now you see more and more people believing that that will happen um, just because of where it's it's gone. Um, but they have to be patient. You know, these exponential things, Amazon took 20 years. You know, all these companies took a lot longer than, you know, they look like they're growing like crazy right now, but it took them a long time to get to that inflection point. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting thought process because you don't have to be right all the time. You got to be right when you see when you see a trend. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be the trend maker either. That's the thing. No. A lot of people think oh, I'm gonna change the world. I'm like, you don't have to. You don't have to do that. You just pay attention to the trends and catch a trend, and you will be fine. Every yeah. time, always new yeah. trends emerging. So just keep an eye open for new trends. We're on that exponential curve, and I think the part of our, you know, where I'm at, I feel very fortunate to be in the place I am because um, I do see my own exponential future. But we're, you know, we'll create 10x the wealth we created in the last 100 years, most likely in the next 10 to 20 years. So if you think of all the money that was made over the last 100 years and you think of all the stuff, that's where we're heading. And that's the exponential future that, you know, part of it is learning about the technologies, but also just putting yourself in a place to whatever you're passionate about. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, you could be the exponential future for that industry um, or that thing. And, you know, we see it over and over again. And you know, the different uh, people that I work with. Um, I never, I never, I often, you know, when you first hear an idea, um, you're just like, I'm not sure that's going to work. And then over time, you know, deceptively, it disrupts a place because they just persistently kept with it. And that's part of the mindset that we've learned is it definitely is not the smartest people that make the most money. It's the people that are most determined. And um, that's part of uh, our training is to help people kind of understand that and and really work through that because it is it is about having a big vision and a big thinking, but understand it takes time to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I think we're, we're gonna end it right here. This is such we covered so much in there, in there. Definitely check out his book. I'm 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 excited to go uh, get his book now and uh, just experience bigger conversation. And I, I don't like regular conversations, you know. You definitely learn a lot more when you have outside the box thinking, especially out, outside the box perspectives shown to you. So um, I'm going to put your website right here. And uh, what is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Uh, no problem can withstand the assault of sustained thinking. It's a Voltaire quote. So it's really old, but uh, it matters today. And it really kind of drives home the message of everything I just said. So... <laughs> Okay. And with that, we'll leave it. We'll leave it. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate uh, your, 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 your uh, service to the community because it's needed and it's, it's uh, appreciated.
All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Daniel. The show is sponsored by The List Guys. Do you need more leads in your local or virtual market? One in 10 small businesses don't invest in any kind of marketing. The List Guys have over 35 plus list types to choose from and you can mix and match any list or criteria. We also use the skip trace list and provide up to seven numbers and email addresses. Every list you purchase will be scrubbed against previous purchases. The List Guys are here to save you time. Contact the List Guys today at www.1listguys.com. That's www.the number one listguys.com.